Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is uh, Simone Tagliapietra. I'm a senior fellow at Bruegel, and I am delighted to welcome you all to what really promises today to be an insightful conversation on international climate cooperation and climate clubs. As we know, protecting the climate is difficult, notably because of free riding. Emissions abatement costs are largely national, but the benefits from climate stability are global. Today, in our event, we will discuss whether the United States, the European Union, and possibly China could overcome this free riding problem by establishing a climate club in which they basically commit to stronger domestic climate measures and agree on coordinated introduction of carbon border adjustment measures. These conversations takes place at a very important moment as global climate ambition gains momentum and as the United States and the European Union relaunch the transatlantic alliance, notably with a strong focus on joint climate action. But let me introduce you our panel today. First in line is United States Senator from Rhode Island, Sheldon Whitehouse. Thank you, Senator, for being with us today. It is a great honor and we do appreciate you taking the time in such a busy period in Washington to be with us. Next is uh, Guntram Wolf, director of Bruegel and co-author of a commentary recently published by Nature on climate collapse. All of you can ask question to Senator Whitehouse and Guntram Wolf. Uh, just go to Slido, 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 and use the code climate club. Without further ado, let me immediately turn to you, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you again for your participation today. And I would be glad to ask you, how do you see the US-EU climate cooperation going forward? And how do you see the issue of carbon border adjustment nowadays? Senator, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Guntram and Bruegel, for including me uh, today. This is a very important conversation to be having. Um, I'll open by saying that I think the Biden administration has won the early battle of the three Ps, personnel, policy, and passion about uh, climate. We in Congress have legislative work to do ahead of us to make good on the president's promises. And I think that's gonna come together uh, fairly well. Um, when you're dealing with border adjustment and carbon pricing, the two are very integrated with one another. Indeed, it can be quite difficult to do a proper border adjustment if you don't have a common carbon pricing measure to uh, set the one against the other and provide fair comparisons. And it is vitally important, as you said, to avoid cheaters and free riders and uh, to make sure that people are measuring up to their commitments and their expectations. So. Um, I'm a supporter of carbon pricing, whether you call it a carbon tax or an emissions fee, uh, whatever rhetoric works best politically is fine with me. Um, but when the International Monetary Fund says that the fossil fuel industry is floating on a $600 billion annual subsidy in the United States alone, it's hard to have renewables have a fighting chance against that kind of a subsidy if you don't offset it with a uh, carbon price. The Senate is actually looking pretty good on carbon pricing. There were four bills in the last Congress. All of their sponsors have indicated that they're going to refile them. One is already refiled. They come from the number two Democrat in the Senate. They come from uh, Joe Biden's friend uh, from Delaware, Chris Coons in the Senate. They come from a little group of climate hawks that I'm a part of. Uh, they come from Chris Van Hollen, who was very instrumental in the House cap and trade years ago. And uh, importantly, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Ron Wyden, has uh, announced publicly that he is going to work on building a carbon pricing mechanism. So the Senate is a pretty strong bastion for carbon pricing. And I think as we work through the infrastructure bill, you'll see the role of the Senate emerge in favor of all of that. Uh, that's all to be done by August. So that's gonna be fast work, uh, but we also have Glasgow coming up and whatever agreements are reached in Glasgow 
uh, we may have to come back in Congress and fill in the promises that were made uh, by the Biden administration uh, and joining the world community to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. On carbon pricing, I think uh, both Treasury Secretary Yellen and Special Envoy John Kerry have made it clear what an important tool this is, how very difficult it is to solve this problem internationally without using carbon pricing and border adjustment. So I think they're looking at this from the uh, right point of view. I'll, I'll close by saying that for um, one of the difficulties that we're having in Congress right now is that while a lot of corporate America nominally supports carbon pricing, none of corporate America's political apparatus, and I will say it is a very powerful and considerable political apparatus, has been actually deployed in favor of carbon pricing. So there's a big gap presently between what American corporate leaders say about how they feel about carbon pricing and what they are either telling or letting their political operation do about carbon pricing. So net net, corporate America is still against the carbon pricing that it publicly claims to support. And I think as that shifts, as CEOs begin to become aware of this liability that they have of telling the public one thing and Congress something different, uh, we'll see some motion there and that will help, I think, free things up in Congress as well. When that happens, that can be a very big shift because in American government, uh, the corporate sector is very powerful and uh, the signal so far is not positive. So with that, I'll turn it back uh, to Guntram to offer his thoughts and, and then uh, we can join the conversation. Exactly, thank you very much, Senator Whitehouse. Guntram, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator, and thank you, Simone, for uh, setting this up. Um, what I thought I would do is uh, talk about our last paper that we co-authored with Simone Tagapieta in Nature, um, and of course, also react uh, to some of the points that Senator Whitehouse made. Um, and the, the starting point of our paper was really the realization that global greenhouse gas emissions do not just happen in one place on the world, in the world, they happen in many, many places in the world. And if just one country or one region of the world decarbonizes, it is simply not enough. Global climate will not be, not, not be saved. Just to give you a perspective of um, the distribution of global greenhouse gas emissions, um, China, has, be, but is, has by now become the biggest emitter in the world. 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions, so more than a quarter, uh, are done in China. Then following that is, is the United States with 13%, the European Union with 8%, India with 7%, and then many other countries with, with smaller percentages. So if you really want to bring down um, and achieve our climate goals, we cannot just do it in one or two countries, we have to do it everywhere and we have to find ways of doing it everywhere. And the fundamental problem why um, progress, also progress since the Paris Agreement hasn't been tremendously big, is that um, it pays to let others do, um, do the climate, um, uh, uh, climate uh, mitigation, so the reduction of, of carbon emissions because if others do it, you don't have to do it. Um, and you basically, or you think you don't have to do it. And you basically can free ride on, on the efforts of others. And so this free riding problem is really, I would say the core of the international climate diplomacy uh, problem. Countries that um, uh, delay their efforts can free ride on the earlier efforts of others and the earlier efforts, efforts can, be, can be costly. Uh, the Nobel Prize winner, William Nordhaus, um, has made very clear that you know, to, to solve that problem, we need to uh, basically use trade. Um, trade uh, penalties uh, to force other countries um, uh, into more action and to, to form what he calls a climate club a climate club where those participating decarbonize more quickly, but where everybody importing, exporting to that climate club uh, would have to actually face um, uh, significant tariffs. Now, the problem with the uh, William Norton's approach really is that um, uh, it is not compatible with um, international trade rules. The WTO trade rules would not uh, allow such a climate club to be formed. 
And that's where really our idea um, comes in, where we are saying, well, what we need is really, we need a climate club based on carbon border adjustment mechanism, based on a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And the idea is very simple. The idea is to um, form an alliance with uh, like-minded countries um, to agree on very fast decarbonization goals uh, in a relatively short period of time um, and uh, to impose um, adjustments at the border for all imports so that there's no carbon leakage, i.e. that production of dirty stuff is not moved um, outside um, of the club. And that would provide an incentive for those outside to actually join um, the, the climate club. So, so this was really our idea. And, and you know, we, we really raised two um, and put forward two reasons why such a climate club is actually more likely um, uh, than it used to be. Um, and I think the two main reasons really are technical progress, technological progress. It has become cheaper uh, to decarbonize than it used to be and increasing domestic political pressure to decarbonize, uh, both in the US as well as in the European Union, you see very strong um, uh, public support, especially among the young, but not only among the young, uh, to really push for more rapid uh, decarbonization. We even now saw, if I can say as a side note, um, uh, the German Constitutional Court um, arguing for uh, faster decarbonization because otherwise the rights of future generations would be violated. So, so there's a lot of action in the domestic politics that makes it actually uh, more attractive um, to, uh, to be de uh, decarbonizing more quickly. So the question really is, um, can we at this stage uh, form um, some sort of a climate club with the United States, um, European Union and the United States, and in doing so, send a very strong signal um, to others, including of course to China, uh, to accelerate um, uh, their dec decarbonization efforts. And I think that's of course a very big political question, but it also involves lots of technical issues. If I can just say on uh, one issue on China, I mean, the big problem with China at the moment is that it has, of course, um, uh, announced that it wants to decarbonize uh, by 2060. However, until 2030, there will be no uh, decarbonization efforts. I mean, there will still be an increase in, uh, in emissions. China opens up lots of coal-fired coal powered uh, fire power plants, coal-fired power plants, and um, you know, as a result, uh, the the emissions actually increase. And you know that that is a real issue. Uh, it is a real issue because um, as the EU accelerates its efforts and the United States accelerates its efforts companies will tend to uh, deplace, delocalize their dirty production to, to China. And it is really that that has to be prevented uh, because otherwise um, even the climate goals, the decarbonization efforts um, that are done domestically um, will be in vain. And so, so, so I think that's, I think it seems to me the broad outline of, of the paper and the idea of the climate club. And I think the politically difficult issue um, Senator, you pointed already to it. Is um, you know how do you how do you form a climate club? How do you do carbon border adjustment when you don't really do your own uh, carbon tax? And I think that's a, or at least an emission trading system. That's at least a, I think a pretty big problem in the United States. In the European Union, there is of course significant progress at this stage. Um, the emission trading system price has gone up quite substantially. Um, in the last couple of years. Um, so there is action here. Um, and it seems to me that um, for the US uh, to uh, really achieve its goals, it will also have to find some ways of um, increasing, increasing the prices. I don't think you can only, I mean, you might be able to do a lot with the regulation, but it might not be quite as efficient. So, uh, so I think there's, there's a big debate here on the tools, the best policy tools. And that's one of the reasons I think that there are a group of us in the Senate who are working so hard to make sure that we can in fact find a way to price emissions and uh, formally do that so that there's a comparable. Um, I, I would add that we've had our bill looked at, our carbon pricing bill, and it has a border adjustment in it. And all of our efforts from former WTO people and from experts uh, have concluded, have told us that what we're doing is WTO compliant. Uh, 
So even if you don't have a proper carbon club because of WTO concerns, if every country passed a border adjustment uh, like ours, and then each one would be WTO compliant, we can get a long way there. Um, I don't know where the difference is between what that would be versus what a carbon club would be. Um, but I think the WTO problem may be more solvable than um, some, some fear. We think it's solvable anyway. I'd add that the, in addition to the free rider problem, which is simply the desire to let other people do the work while you coast, uh, there's also the political problem of the fossil fuel industry still engaged in a very hostile and uh, malign fashion to try to degrade at least America's capability to move legislatively. So it's free rider plus. It's free rider plus a really, <laughs> really bad angel on the shoulder of uh, some of the uh, free riders to tell them to stay out of the uh, uh, out of the club and away from helping. And that's not to be overlooked because the fossil fuels power, particularly over the Republican Party <clears throat> in uh, the U.S. Congress, is not to be overlooked. And the last thing I'll say is is when you get into carbon removal and you get into this question of um, how you can afford these new innovative technologies that can help solve our problem, you really do have to have carbon pricing to make that work. And that's what makes the innovation explode. And it doesn't help with innovation if you can't do a border adjustment and so people leak across to a more favorable climate, uh, regulatory and legal climate, uh, rather than look around for who's doing the innovation. Mm -hmm. And I think we're now at a perilous enough place that we have to bank on investing in carbon removal and carbon reduction strategies. Uh, just reducing the amount of our emissions is not enough. We've got to be able to draw excess carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere in order to have a really safe landing path, I think. And again, that connects very closely into having a proper border adjustment and having a proper carbon price. So when people like Bill Gates talk about innovation, it's really important to understand that innovation is not a panacea. There is no innovation fairy that can sprinkle innovation fairy dust on the problem and make it go away. You have to create the economic conditions for that innovation to prosper. And that's where carbon pricing and border adjustment come in. Uh, Senator Whitehouse, if I may follow up to this, uh, how likely it is that uh, the United States over the next four years will establish a carbon pricing system at the federal level? Because the understanding, at least from Brussels, of uh, the climate policy developments in the US is that President Biden uh, focuses on, green, on, on a mix of green investments and uh, basically environmental regulation to do the job. So is this the case or can we expect carbon pricing to really get through at the federal level, even if during the campaign, uh, Biden himself didn't really pledge for the introduction of a carbon pricing system at the federal level? Well, you know, in his statements uh, campaigning, the president was very open to pricing carbon and, and specifically said that you shouldn't allow polluters to get away with polluting for free. Um, he chose not to lead with that because rhetorically he's leading with the most popular thing that he possibly could, which is jobs and clean energy, which everybody supports. And um, I simply would not rule out, you know, the Senate has a vote in this. You don't pass legislation without the Senate. And there are a considerable number of senators who are quite determined as shown by legislation they have prepared and filed to pursue carbon pricing, whether it's now in the infrastructure bill in an August timeframe, or perhaps after Glasgow as part of implementation of whatever the treaty agreement is, but don't underestimate our resolve in the Senate to get something done and don't underestimate the need for the Senate to be a participant in this. Um, so at the end of the day, you may find that when the bill gets to the Senate, it goes through some transformation and uh, moves in this direction. Oh, that is certainly very reassuring. Uh, thank you. Uh, Guntram, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted to uh, to just react and, and make two comments. I mean, the, the first is really on uh, the importance of carbon pricing for efficiency reasons, really. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do understand that 
of course, it's unpopular um, to see you, your gas price go up. But if you think on a sort of macro uh, economy wide level, that you, you can get to a decarbonization without sort of a general price, it would uh, a general price increase for the carbon emissions, it would really lead to lots of um, uh, uh, inefficient outcomes, lots of investments that would be needed that otherwise wouldn't be needed. And even I think on the job market, it would be uh, would be worse than um, than a strategy where you have some some carbon pricing. So so from an efficiency point of view, I think it's very important. You mentioned the technology side. Um, absolutely. I mean, of course, we need um, support and, and everything for, you know, breakthrough technology. Um, but um, you do need um, uh, uh, at least in some uh, in some segments, you still need um, higher carbon prices for the uh, you know clean energy, clean uh, uh, clean uh, production methods to actually take off because otherwise yeah. they're just not not efficient enough um, to be to be adopted by business. So the, the, I think the price signal is actually quite quite fundamental. Now I wanted the, the second point I wanted to uh, to to signal is and and react to is the whole question of WTO compatibility, because I, I talked a bit about it, and I think it's it's really quite crucial. Um, you cannot uh, implement a system which would not be uh, WTO compatible. If you, if you were to do this, countries can retaliate uh, with um, basically trade measures um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, basically um, uh, that would undermine your, your attempts to uh, sort of incentivize other countries to, um, to decarbonize more quickly. So I, I really think the WTO compatibility is important. Um, if you do a carbon border adjustment mechanism properly, it can be done in a way that's WTO compatible. And the, the key issue here is really non-discrimination, meaning uh, a producer, a domestic producer that uh, you know sells a ton of steel is taxed as much as a foreign producer that is selling a ton of steel. That's the core principle. As long as you basically achieve that principle, um, uh, you, you are in compliance with the non-discrimination clause of the WTO. And, and that's also where I see the climate club moving, right? So, and there I agree with you, whether it's a formal agreement or an informal agreement, but um, you do need sort of, um, let's say, if we were to start, and that's perhaps where I want to push you a bit, Senator, if we were to start uh, with an agreement between the EU and the United States, um, could, we, could we find an agreement where even if we have different approaches to carbon pricing and regulation, but we at least have similar goals and similar decarbonization passes, that we have relatively comparable external carbon border adjustment uh, mechanisms so as to sort of provide an incentive and you know really push others, including China, into you know, quicker action. Well, I'll leave former Secretary Kerry and current Secretary Blinken to um, work out uh, the US-EU uh, relationship on this. Um, but I do think that they're both very committed to it. I do think that strategically, it's vitally important that there be a US-EU uh, consolidation uh, of strategy so that we're moving forward taking the same steps. I do think that carbon pricing and border adjustment is likely necessary to achieving our climate goals. I don't see a way around it. Um, and so I think a lot of the pieces are lined up all in the right direction, um, as you say. And I do think that US-EU leadership together is gonna be very important uh, to send a signal, particularly when you're sending an economic signal and you put the US and the EU economies together um, and suddenly you've got a very, very powerful signal going out to some of the uh, other, perhaps more recalcitrant countries. Uh, Senator Whitehouse, we are starting to collect uh, questions from the audience, and we got one question from uh, Julian Popov, former uh, Minister of the Environment of uh, Bulgaria. And uh, Julian asks, uh, the United States uh, supports more gas in Europe despite EU import overcapacity. How will you bring climate and energy security policy consistency in this context? Hmm. So how to cope these two different- uh, Yeah, um, good question. Um, the 
petro politics of Russia um, in the European region are obviously complicated and powerful. Um, and working in that space can be a challenge. We obviously have um, an industry um, that shares some interests with the natural gas industry that is behind the pipelines, but also tries to sometimes position itself as a potential rival, which makes things a little bit complicated at uh, our end. I am not a fan of the Nordstrom pipeline. Uh, I do think it contributes to uh, the politics that flow along it, just along with the hydrocarbons are gonna be um, dangerous. And I think in the last decade, we've missed a considerable opportunity in uh, countries like the Ukraine to put in significant, uh, help them with significant uh, infrastructure investment in renewables to relieve some of that Russian petro-political pressure. Um, but that's probably a little bit more complicated than my pay grade entitles me to uh, opine on. I do think that if we can solve the problems that we're talking about today of how you get to at least a Atlantic-wide carbon price and then expand that to the rest of the world with proper border adjustment to protect against leakage, then some of these other problems how you solve them becomes easier and different than if you haven't solved that problem. So I think in terms of you know, analyzing what steps you wanna take, I think it's gonna be really important that we try to solve this in Glasgow in November. Right. Simone, perhaps if I can add on this point, I mean, we, uh, and we, we have another paper, um, which we, we published uh, actually in Foreign Affairs, a little note, uh, in which we did highlight um, the Russian issue and um, you know the the implications that Europe's Green Deal and Europe's decarbonization has uh, for have for um, our neighboring countries, including including Russia. And it turns out that uh, for Russia, um, the decade until 2030 is still very benign because um, gas will be imported and is actually also a transition. Um, uh, energy uh, that will be needed uh, as we decarbonize and get off, get rid of coal. But as of 2030, the drop in imports of gas um, will be quite substantial. And so, so the geopolitical implications of that for the EU-Russia relation, but also for Russia potentially trying to find um, other customers, including perhaps customers to the Southeast um, that are pretty big. Um, uh, are, are very significant, and so I think I do think there is real scope to to reflect on what's what one should do really uh, about the the relationship with Russia, especially in the period after twenty thirty. And particularly if they're not being effective at dealing with methane leakage, yeah. the only way that natural gas is an improvement over anything is if you assume the measurement is at the burner tip. But as we've seen in some of the American gas fields, you put enough methane leakage up into the air and suddenly natural gas is not a climate improvement over other fuels. So we're gonna to have to be very clear about making sure that the Russians are accountable for the leakage of their product. And uh, luckily we have satellite technologies that now allow that to happen more accurately. Fully, fully agree on this point. And if I can add one more point on the on the Russians, since we since we are there, I mean, an, an important an important dimension is also the uh, the thawing of the the permafrost uh, in 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 Siberia. Essentially, I mean, if that is uh, if that is thawing too quickly, um, we are reaching tipping points very quickly. So one of the issues we also mention uh, more en passant in the Nature article is really that the global community needs a strategy for uh, for that and you know it needs to support and i think that's perhaps also a positive uh, incentive that one could provide um, support russia with uh, a basically an environmental policy that uh, slows down the thawing of permafrost yeah in the permafrost there's a lot of methane actually which is a, which is a climate uh, climate killer and, and by the way, this also uh, gives me the opportunity to take up uh, another of uh, the questions we are getting, which really relates to the overall EU-US uh, climate cooperation agenda moving forward. 
And I think uh, that, uh, as we also mentioned in the nature piece, that uh, this idea of having a, a really a global alliance on what can be considered as global common goods. So uh, not only this issue of the permafrost, but also, for example, the issue of reforestation or the issue of uh, joint innovation efforts in frontier technologies, think at green hydrogen. So I wonder whether are these uh, elements, in your view, potential parts of an EU-US climate cooperation uh, on climate? We know that in one month's time, President Biden will visit uh, uh, Brussels. Uh, in that occasion, there will be the US-EU uh, summit and climate features, of course, uh, among the top priority pri priorities of this summit. So we are building up this transatlantic climate alliance. What are the components of it? For Brussels, uh, uh, carbon border adjustment uh, certainly is seen as an important element potentially, uh, but are there also in your view, other elements that can fit into that? Well, I think there are um, a great number of elements um, to help with the um, injustice, of uh, climate suffering by countries that had very small climate contributions. Um, I think that we are bumping up against having to much more aggressively defend both terrestrial wilderness and significant sectors of the ocean in order to stabilize uh, our planetary systems. Um, and conservation, obviously land and sea becomes a very important part of that. Those two questions connect with each other in the case of many uh, countries. Um, so I think that we're gonna have, a, this is gonna be the issue of the next decade. I mean, this is gonna be our great global question. How do we solve this and how do we solve it fairly? And, um, but I do think that it opens the door to better solutions if we've started with a common carbon price between the US and the EU with a border adjustment capability to uh, defend against the leakage. And then once that's in place, you can then build on that. And if you have revenues, you can use the revenues to augment that um, and, and on you go. But yeah, we're the question of carbon pricing and border adjustment is the vestibule question into a much, much larger room behind it of how do we protect the planet in ways that don't make us a disgraceful generation in the eyes of our children and grandchildren. Yeah, and also following up what you said, it's very important to, to consider the issue of how you utilize the revenues of mm -hmm. uh, both carbon pricing and carbon border adjustment, right? Because yeah. if, uh, also with the manifesto that a number of American economists signed uh, almost a year and a half ago, among whom also Janet Yellen, of course, uh, about carbon dividends. So the idea of using uh, the, the revenues for carbon pricing also to enhance uh, uh, the, the social equality, that is a very important issue domestically, but uh, the same issue can also be applied internationally with CBAN. For example, uh, we mentioned in the piece uh, that uh, the revenues of carbon border adjustment could be utilized to scale up climate finance. So to, to really support, further support developing countries in their uh, sustainable development process, rather than financing international reforestation activity, et cetera. And by the way, that might also be uh, another way to show that this is not about trade uh, penalties, this is about climate, and that could also uh, facilitate the WTO compl compliance and compatibility uh, in, the, in, that, in that aspect. So uh, I think you're very right in raising this issue of the revenues and very right in flagging how this uh, measure can really be seen as the mother of all climate cooperation measures down the road. And by the yeah. way, at least in Europe, as it is perceived, it is also a matter of ensuring the domestic uh, political support to the carbonization, because we already see in Europe with uh, now the, the price of carbon in DTS uh, uh, skyrocketing to levels uh, like 40 euros per ton and more, et cetera, that uh, we never had in the past. We see already companies seriously complaining about uh, 
uh, you know, this issue uh, and claiming they need the carbon border adjustment measures in order to ensure a level playing field. So if we are to protect, uh, uh, to ensure the level playing field and thus protect the jobs and industrial competitiveness, this really becomes uh, a necessary measure once uh, you are either ambitious on climate, uh, on carbon pricing or on, on environmental regulations, by the way. Yeah, my, my view on this in the United States is that we need to succeed with four constituencies mm. economically in order to have carbon pricing uh, be politically uh, palatable and effective. Uh, the first is the environmental justice communities who are scared of carbon pricing alone because they don't want to see some machine strip carbon dioxide out of the air and restore the planet to health while they still have to live with the sludge and the coal ash and the particulate matter and the mercury and everything else. So they've got an important stake. Economically, it has to be progressive and we can make it that. Um, we need to take care of the transition, what I call the energy veterans who built the American economy. Uh, they won that battle and they're entitled to come home and have people take care of them and be proud of what they did. And then the states are gonna have their own problems. And I think the states are a constituency, each of them, Wyoming, is gonna have a very different set of climate problems than Rhode Island, and each state needs to make sure that they see a way through there. So those are my four prime constituencies for supporting a carbon price. And the only thing I'll say about the foreign side is that I think an important thing to keep an eye on that we can start working on right now is to make sure we have really good validated offsets so that if you want to offer helping with, reforestation in Brazil as a way that you can get some of those revenues, either from a company that's pledged to be carbon neutral or as a investment to uh, be able to offset a carbon price charge. Uh, you, you, we've got to do a lot better job of making sure that those are real investments and uh, that it's all properly validated. And what we would call in the United States, the good housekeeping seal of approval uh, is on them and it's real because the early offsets had a lot of um, error and mischief and mistake in them and we've got to clean that up. That would be a very good global purpose to try to set a global standard for what's a real offset and what isn't and how do you measure it and how much credit do you get for it. And in the same way that the bank would go to an investment and, and analyze it, we need to have um, an international offset credibility uh, standard of some kind, a bank for that. But on this standardization issue, do you think that the US and the EU can, for example, team up on the sustainable taxonomy issue? Because uh, yeah. there, was, there was hope. Yeah. In, in I mean, the... I think it's happening already. Some of the environmental organizations that got burned early on when they were misled about various projects are trying to improve that. Um, there's more analysis from think tanks going into what that looks like. I think as we get to carbon pricing, it's going to really enliven the ability of people to spend in other countries. If you'd rather spend, you know, $40 in Brazil to avoid a $50 carbon price at home, we want to make sure that that's real and that you can bring that ticket with you. Um, we just passed, a, well, passed it out of committee and it's headed, I think, for passage in Congress a bill that requires our Department of Agriculture to set up a program to certify carbon offsets for farmers so that they know what behavior of theirs will get them what credit and they can monetize the value of good behavior uh, to their own interests. And I think things like that, the more we can spread that, the better off we all are. You know, it's like a lead building. Nobody needs to know the details, but if you've got like gold lead, platinum lead, then everybody flocks to that because it's been branded as legit. And I think that's what we need to do for a lot of these offsets. Good role for Voigo. <laughs> Indeed. No, I mean, I, 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 I mean, just to react, I mean, I, I think one, one important dimension you mentioned that is, is of course also agriculture and agriculture plays an important role in global emissions. I mean, it's, it's one of the drivers of global emissions, in fact, and uh, at least on the EU side, we are not terribly good in, uh, in managing those emissions. And uh, of course, there is also a lot of trade with food, right? I mean, a lot of trade uh, with food. And, and I think sort of thinking about 
what would it mean um, to uh, sort of impose uh, carbon border adjustment on food imports and you know how we can make sure that a country like let's say brazil that is a major uh, of course uh, food exporter um, will not sort of feel discriminated against and will you know um, not experience the whole um, decarbonization efforts um, of the more advanced economies as actually an assault on on its own development prospects i think is a is a key issue and and i think the issue really becomes quite big if I can add so because those um, poorer countries they will argue well wait a minute I mean why why are we now forced to decarbonize as quickly as you are doing it even though you guys the United States you have been responsible for the bulk of uh, the um, the co2 that has been emitted in the last 40 years or 50 years right so so there is a this this issue of international, uh, climate justice, I think, is, is quite important. And I think thinking yeah. a little bit more about sort of what can we offer to the low income countries um, and the med middle income countries as technological support, for example, I think is quite important. Agreed. Um, there is a question that comes from uh, Malcolm that brings us, I think, to another important discussion, which is related to China. Malcolm asks, uh, when you have surging green political parties in Europe and a strong movement in the United States, are they ready to sacrifice human rights regarding China? This question, uh, I think, brings to the table uh, the doctrine, let's say, that we have understood from President Biden about trying to separate climate issue with, in the relationship with China from other issues. And uh, that came clear in a foreign affairs article that uh, Joe Biden published uh, last year before becoming president. And this is a sort of doctrine that is now becoming more and more clear also thanks to the recent visit of uh, John Kerry to, to China. So what's your take on that? How can the United States, but like Europe, engage with China uh, on climate, while clearly there are also uh, other elements of criticality there? I think you said it. I think that we have to create a separate climate conversation that focuses on climate and on solving our problem with what Pope Francis calls our common home so that our common home doesn't get ruined and have our disputes over other matters um, kept in a separate lane. And I think in politics and in international diplomacy, it's not the least bit unusual to have separate lanes for separate issues, given how toxic the relationship between China and the United States uh, became under President Trump. I was uh, pleased to see how quickly John Kerry was able to open up a separate climate lane uh, with the Chinese. Uh, obviously, they've got a lot of work to do to get there, as uh, Guntram pointed out, but um, they don't seem to be holding the climate issue hostage to other issues. And I think they and others see that um, the world community is gonna have to move. And if you want to be a world leading country, you've gotta be, a important part of that conversation. And it's really not in your interest to uh, stay out of that conversation and be a spoiler um, if you have the ambitions that China has. So um, I think it raises a lot of issues for them about, well, a whole variety of issues, but it, it was reassuring to see that Secretary Kerry was able to open up that uh, separate lane for China so readily out of the kind of just disastrous uh, uh, state of our relations. Yeah, and indeed we have to say that uh, notwithstanding uh, the recently published uh, five years plan of China was rather discouraging on climate uh, two weeks ago, thanks to the climate uh, summit uh, convened by President Biden, we heard for the first time President Xi talking about uh, a, a reduction or a serious consideration yeah. of, about the role of coal of the next five years, which signals uh, an important uh, change of course 
on what could factually be considered as the individually uh, most uh, uh, probably damaging uh, item we have globally to the climate, which is the coal utilization in a country like China. So, well, if the competitive standard you have to meet with your rival is better than Trump, that's an extremely low bar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now that the competitiveness standard is, is better than Biden, they're going to have to up their game a lot. And yeah. they might not even get there, but they'll be competing against a whole new standard. Absolutely. But, um, if I can add, I mean, it also changes a lot, of course, the dynamics from an EU point of view. I mean, um, under President Biden, um, uh, Chinese uh, visitors were quite frequent here in Brussels trying to form a coalition with the European Union uh, on climate because the US was absent. And, yeah. and thankfully now the US is back. And um, you know, I, I think there is really scope for a trilateral club. So a club that you know, brings, brings together the US, um, the EU, and I think, as you said uh, very aptly, China ultimately has an interest not to stay out of, of this because if it stays out, the signal is terrible. And yeah. it's just not a seat at the top table on, on this topic. So I, I do think there, there should be some willingness. But I think also we need to be ready um, if, um, if China does not move quickly enough, um, you know, we, 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 we do have to move. And, you know, that means carbon border adjustment would have to be applied to imports from China. I mean, there's yeah. no way around it. Yep. Yeah. And that would send a very powerful signal to them, I think. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Senator Wetau, you mentioned Trump, and therefore we got a question about Republicans. So uh, the question from Mr. Anonymous goes, uh, uh, Senator Wetau, to what extent are your Republican colleagues in the Senate ready to educate their voters on the impending damage caused by climate change? How do you see the attitude in the Republican Party about this issue? And a critical question that I see often being asked in the uh, Brussels corridors is, what happens if in four years time we get, we get another president? How much can we lock in, in terms of climate policy in the United States that yeah. stays there even if we get another president in the future? Over the next yeah, so we obviously want to lock in as, as much as we can so that it ends up, you know, protected behind a veto or protected, be able to be protected by one house or the other of, of Congress. So it's very important that we take advantage of this moment to do the most uh, that we can. I think um, my experience is this. I came to the Senate in 2007. In January, I was sworn in and for three years, 07, 08, and a very bipartisan Congress going on on climate. We had uh, bipartisan bills, four of them in the Senate. We had a Republican, John McCain, run for president with a very strong climate platform. Um, it was sort of a, a good era. And then in January of 2010, something happened. And that something, I believe, was that the Republican judges on the Supreme Court said that uh, political interests could spend unlimited amounts of money in politics. Congress couldn't regulate political spending. And that gave the fossil fuel industry with this $600 billion subsidy to protect uh, unlimited license to spend money in politics. And they went right at the Republican Party to hammer all dissent out of the Republican Party and to reward the worst behavior in the Republican Party and you, there was an immediate shift. It was uh, instantaneous from having four climate bills and a senator with a presidential climate platform on the Republican side to absolutely deathly silence for a decade. So I think that if, this is why I mentioned corporate America earlier on, if corporate America starts to take an interest in climate politics in the United States, they can provide enough reassurance to Republicans who are now subject to enormous pressure by the fossil fuel industry to have hydraulic balance so that they can begin to make more rational decisions without putting their careers uh, in peril. And that's one of the reasons I think it's so important that corporate America quit goofing off and show up in Congress as if this mattered to them, which is something that has not yet been done. Um, because I think the, the, the problem behind that question is that they assume that Republicans are in some 
categorical way opposed on climate, that this is a partisan thing. My experience has been that that is not true, that it became that way the instant the fossil fuel industry got this unlimited money and went out to uh, impede American politics. You might even say corrupt American politics as much as it possibly could. And I think it's gonna be a very shameful legacy for that industry that they cost us this decade um, and put up all these front groups and all these lies and fake science and political pressure and hidden money. I mean, the whole thing is nasty, but they did it. So counterbalance that or end that and suddenly you'll have Republicans supporting us again. It's, I, but, but where, do you corporate, where do you see, I mean, if I can push you on that point, I mean, of course, the point is the terrible point you're making uh, that, you know, basically uh, one of the two parties um, of the United States has been completely corrupted. And, you know, I think um, I don't want to comment on this from, from the outside, but, but where do you see the corporate world and, you know, how much, how much has the no. corporate world, because th there are more and more companies that, that really also make a, make a business out of, out of green, right? So yeah. how's that changing? Very slowly, and not to the point where there is any serious political pressure from corporate America in Congress to do anything significant on climate. There are lots of conversations in think tanks. There are CEO groups where people get together and think great thoughts and make great pronouncements. Um, there's a really good, really good amount of sustainability work being done within corporations to clean up their own carbon footprint and even push good things out their supply chains. I give them real credit for that. But in my world, in Congress, um, their trade associations, their lobbyists have virtually nothing to say about climate change. Um, Coke and Pepsi, the two big drinks companies, the American Beverage Association is their trade association, hasn't lifted a finger on climate. All the big Silicon Valley companies, you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Salesforce, they come to us through a group called TechNet, which barely mentioned climate and renewables this year. And last year didn't mention either. They filed a 13 page instruction manual for what they wanted from Congress. And you couldn't find the word climate change or renewable in 13 pages of what Google, Apple, Microsoft, Salesforce and the rest of Silicon Valley wanted. So there's this enormous gap between what they tell the public they are doing and what they tell Congress to do. And that gap needs to close. Very clear. And of course, uh, carbon pricing could be one of the, way, of the ways to let this gap close. It's what they say they want whether you're at the Climate Leadership Council or the Business Roundtable or at Ceres or C2ES, any of the groups that have assembled corporations to talk about this, it's almost inevitable that a border adjustable revenue neutral carbon price is their position. It's common across pretty much all of the Republican corporate and libertarian think tank world, um, but, but it dies in those well. think tanks and doesn't transmit to Congress. They don't, don't put the money where the mouth is. So to speak. And, and in my line of work, people know the difference. Indeed. And uh, uh, we are getting to, towards the, the end, but uh, we still have a couple of questions that I think could be asked to the, to the Senate. And uh, one indeed relates to this issue and uh, asks uh, basically how does the US uh, shale gas fit into uh, the climate club, but more in general into, into climate action because under the Obama years, uh, shale gas certainly played an important role to decarbonize the, the American economy thanks to a major coal to gas uh, shift. But uh, what about uh, the role of gas in the US uh, system today and over the, for the next- uh, the, the problem was that um, the natural gas industry um, was not very helpful at reporting its methane leakage. And towards the end of the Obama administration, they entered into a variety of agreements and 
um, supported some EPA policies about methane leakage reporting. And then as soon as President Trump was elected, they walked away from all of that. They knew they could get whatever they wanted. And so the natural gas industry behaved very, very badly about methane leakage. And now we have all these efforts to try to catch up after four years of their bad behavior. Um, but it's not easy to recover that. It's a short term, relatively, maybe 30 years greenhouse gas, but hugely powerful, 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in that period. And the whole concept of natural gas being a better uh, climate fuel than coal was premised on at the burner tip. Again, if you go back up the pipelines into the wells and you start measuring what the methane leakage looks to be, um, it's not at all clear what kind of an improvement it is, if any at all. Um, and the way in which the industry refused to clean up its act when it had the chance and refused to al allow itself to be measured when it should have been very forthcoming about that information um, has put them, I think, in some real discredit and some real peril. But again, you go back to a carbon price and a lot of that matters less because you're not having to go at individual facilities and individual fuels. You're setting a market-wide standard and you're letting the economy adjust to it. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Senator. And uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, we all got uh, two very clear messages from you today. One is that the Senate is serious about carbon pricing and we should not phase out uh, the possibility of seeing uh, carbon pricing at the federal level in the US uh, in the near future. The second point is that even if uh, we might tend to think the opposite, at least for the Silicon Valley companies you mentioned, corporate America still needs to take real action here and uh, way more action should be, uh, should be done uh, or pushed to these, uh, to these actors. Guntram, do you have a reaction to uh, all what we have said uh, since uh, we are about to close? Do you want to- I mean, I think we covered really a lot of ground. I mean, I guess the one question I would want to push you on, uh, on Senator, the one very last, very quick question is, you know, what if the United States does not increase prices and does not decarbonize as quickly as the European Union? Um, uh, and the European Union imposes a carbon border adjustment mechanism vis-a-vis -vis the US. What would, what, what would be your take? I think that would be, um, there, I think there'd be a wide array of responses. You can predict what former President Trump would be saying and his uh, acolytes. Um, I think there are some who would say, well, if that's what it takes to make us move, then that's what it takes to make us move. Stupid of us not to be in the leadership group and have to be dragged along by border adjustments. Um, Canada could well do the same thing. Um, I don't know about this Mexican government, but Mexico could well do the same thing. We could be quite surrounded um, with border adjustments and that might be what it takes to get our attention, but I very, very much hope. I don't believe that will be necessary I think that the president very much wants to lead on this. And um, I hope that that's a consideration we don't have to face. I'm very glad you say that. And I really sincerely also hope it, um, of course, with UK, um, but also with Canada, the EU is talking. I mean, certainly with the UK. And, um, uh, you know, I do think it, it would be really stupid if the transatlantic um, economic area wouldn't move as quickly as possible and do so together. Yeah, agreed. By the way, just to put there uh, some dates, uh, the European Commission uh, announced yesterday that uh, the proposal of carbon border adjustment will be presented on July 14th. Uh, and in any case, uh, uh, the expected uh, uh, start of the measure in Europe is uh, 2023. So we still have two good years to, to work together on this item. This is not something that will happen before the COP uh, uh, from the European uh, side. We have two years ahead of us. And uh, let's really hope that also thanks to the action of the Senate, uh, these uh, uh, two years can really be used to create a system that can really be long lasting and uh, really lock in the transatlantic alliance into a solid uh, climate, uh, climate cooperation in the future. Yes. Senator Whitehouse. Um on to Glasgow.
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, we so reached much. the end of our time. Thank you, uh, Senator Whitehouse, on behalf of uh, the World Bruegel family for being with us today. It was a great honor, a great pleasure. We learned a lot about what's going on in the US. Thank you so much, and hopefully see you soon in person. Hope so. All the best. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.